Yes, okay, awesome. Yeah, so welcome everybody very much to the December meetup. Yeah, pizza just arrived and we are all still eating or hungry or whatever. And so thanks for coming and so we are a bit late today. Um, yeah, I don't have something special. I'm very happy that you all came here and made it and yeah, weather doesn't make it easier. There's so many other events. It seems like uh, this Wednesday is the only day in December where it's officially last to a non-Christmas related uh, thing. <laughs> I've uh, got like five invites for different technical and non-technical things, all not Christmas related, but all on this one day. Oh, uh, and so I'm very happy you chose this event. And yeah, we let's uh, start with our first talk from Christian and Nip Shuffle. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Ole. Um, yeah, thanks, for the, thanks for the opportunity. I, I think I submitted this talk like a couple of months ago, and then I was excited that I got accepted. Uh, and uh, I needed to refresh my, my project a little bit because I, I didn't touch it back then. Oh, since then. But anyhow, I'm still excited and I'm again even more excited now that I can uh, take this talk to the Go Long meetings. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of the project is to split workshops up into like individual packages, if you will, and then use it or, or treat it like a software package. And I, I the motivation was I, I used to work for Amazon. Like um, I was in charge of the, the workshops for the HPC um, uh, branch. And of course you had a lot of like solution architects and whoever, like they were creating workshops, but they were creating workshops like everyone is creating workshops nowadays, right? Or like for forever, like create a workshop you like or take a workshop you like, copy it over and then tweak or tweak it, uh, rip out the stuff that you want to replace and then off you go. And that's your workshop, right? And if you want to make, make another workshop, you take the workshop you like again, maybe the one that you started next uh, before, and you um, create a new workshop. And it's very hard to, to upstream changes or make different kind of workshops from the same source. So I have a little problem slide here, and it's what I just talked about. I will uh, do in a slight motion here. So workshops are, of course, different in different structures with different backgrounds. So companies maybe have different ways of creating workshops and community skill level and so on. So you want to have like different kind of workshops. I think for, for my uh, group, for the HPC group in AWS, we had kind of this kind of workshop structure. We had a landing page, of course, we had an introduction to all the services and projects that were used in the workshop. Then you had a setup, like spin up, and I need to like admit people again. Uh, you had to um, introduce all the stuff. Then you, you you have a setup phase where you maybe create an AWS EC2 instance or whatever. Then a little hello world where you just verify that the setup works. And then you have your workshop topic. That's the big part. And afterwards you have cleanup and like um, the, the takeaway message and so on. So that was kind of the workshop structure that we have. Of course, all the solution architects or every, every author only cares about his topic, right? He doesn't care about how the setup, he doesn't care about which version of EC2 was used and so on. So he was just putting his whatever website creation or simulation run, he created, put it in this workshop topic piece and the rest he didn't care about. He just wanted to use a boilerplate that was provided to him. But again, when we start with an existing workshop, you copy it from someone else, maybe the boilerplate that your group provides you. And then you want to change a little bit of the landing page because you need like some introduction to your workshop and you want to change the topic. And the rest, you might not even want to change. But how to contribute back? That's like the big problem, right? And then maybe you have a second version of the workshop where you create a new version of the landing page. And I think I have some animation here, here you go. And some introduction piece you want to change because you realize, okay, maybe I want a new version that I need to introduce and set up. And you want to uh, also change the cleanup because you change the setup, you need to change the clean of course. So you had some, some changes in your workshop and it was very hard to contribute back to the original one. 
I think I just copied that one. Okay, so let's say you have an initial workshop to just make it a little bit bigger here. I use the initial one. I create the first version of the workshop. Then I rip out the, the topic, the main topic. I create a new version, like the second version with a different topic, but the same setup, some, some tweaks to the setup even. And um, then I have a third one. Horse is creating one and Anya is even copying from different pieces all over the place. And it's very hard to have a consistent setup and introduction pace or phase. Or if you have a, a new version in the intro, then populating or, or yeah, populating all the workshops that are already existing and updating them is super hard, right? So that's why I created QShift. And of course, Golang project, we are on a Golang meetup. And the idea is that you treat as it says in the on the tin, you treat workshops or, or documentation like software packages even. So what I mean by that, and that's where we do a little demo. So let's say I have a, a workshop and I think the font is fine, right? So we have a, a manifest, a YAML manifest that just describes the workshop. So you can create a title, a description, you, you name the authors and the main part is you define pages which are like you have different levels here, of course, you have a, a, a level home, that's a landing page, and you can specify what the source is. So the source is just a directory. If we look at the landing page, for instance, it's just somewhere here, landing page, Golang Observatory. And we have some markdown here. And the whole manifest is just describing the structure of the workshop, the title of the, of the page, and then it's just a big tree of different pieces. If I compile this, like compile in the sense of like software compilation, so you take this manifest, it will spit out an mkdocs directory that renders like this. So you have the home, and of course I need to start it. Here we go. So I'm just like, let me get this out of the way somehow. How do I get this out of the way? In a minute, whatever. So I run a little Docker container to just render the markdown and it will look like this. So that's my home. That's what we saw here in the, in the, uh, the, the the markdown file landing here we go so you can see like dep developing golang is fun that's basically it right so and the other pieces are the same you have the introduction where's my yaml file here we go so we have the introduction with we, we have like sub pages within the introduction and you get the gist right so we have different pages and then we we can go through this here and the idea is that you can take this manifest, copy it over, like copy a second one, use a new title, use maybe a new landing page, then rip out the part that's a real deal, and then put in your new your new version. So I do this. I call it, and I'm really annoyed by this Zoom bar that's in the right where it shouldn't be. Let's put it up here. So let's say it's copy two. And then I call this focus two. I can compile it. And it will take all the pages, as you can see here, it will take all the individual index file or markdown files, put it in a markdown and MK doc structure. Also like parsing, of course, the markdown and figuring out if there is a, a picture included, or it will take out the picture, copy it in the appropriate place in the mkdocs directory. And um, yeah, and then you can just run the, the Docker container again. This Docker container is watching for changes, so it should be changed already. So we can see here now we have focus two. All right, and the cool thing is, like, I think it's cool, that you can just uh, treat those little pages as, a, as software packages kind of. So if I create a new setup, I can say like, look, I have this new setup now. So if you update your, um, your, your manifest or even I can update it for you, we can just create a new workshop with the updated introduction, 
we see iterated setup and cleanup. So all the boilerplate stuff that you don't care about anyway. So let me take care of you uh, for you for you of this and create like a kind of a software, like software packaging system, if you will, for workshops. So that was the, the basic idea. Um, any questions so far? Can you see how this might, <clears throat> can you sort of uh, explain how this might benefit, how teams can collaborate with each other? Yeah, I think, as, as I said, like in the, the HPC product team for AWS, I was in charge of the workshop mm -hmm. stream. And if we have a new release, we need to create workshops for this new release, right? So let's say we have a new version of service A. Yeah. Um, and like to create like different workshops for this, for different customers or user bases, we need to create like multiple workshops. Mm -hmm. So if I created a boilerplate workshop for everyone to use, and then everyone was just putting in their customer story or customer use case within this main topic piece. And it was very cumbersome to always come up with a new version and you want maybe to update because you learned something new. You wanted to update not only the current one, but you wanted to populate or, or upstream the update to the previous versions of the workshops. So you needed to copy the content in each and every instance of the workshop. And it was like, yeah, unmanageable. And another thing is that because people were just copying boilerplate code or, or workshops from known locations, we didn't know what workshops were out there, right? Because people were just like creating workshops on their own and then taking it to customers and never mentioned this to us. Never, never, uh, we had never like a, a pool of workshop that we can rely on because no one was really um, f uh, sending back information of what workshops existed. And with this, we had like a, a nice tool or like I started it, but I, I re-implemented it for MK Dogs anyways. But the intention was to have a tool that lures people into this project so that they just take um, take the boilerplate, but also use updates and also contribute back to the original, like the, the big tree or repository of pages and, and workshops. That was the idea. So I, I, yeah, I tried to fix my own problems basically because I was uh, the one who, and the, the problem was that the, the solution architect, they, they didn't have it in their targets to create workshops. So it was always like, okay, can you please, can you please? And uh, I needed to find something to make them want to work with us to create workshops in a, in a good sense. Can you just go back and work through the um, structures of repository again? Yeah, so I have manifests, which are the manifests. Uh, I can also include, I, I, as I said, I, 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 I reuse this um, or I, I warmed it up again, but what, I, what you also can do is you can include other workshops into this workshop. So let's say, and let me find someone here. So a manifest defines a workshop. A manifest is just a structure, right? The title, the description, pages, and and the, the order of the pages as well. You can see weight, right? So weight zero. Um, yeah, so that is that is that. And then we have the, the page base, which just tells you, okay, where are the default, where are the pages? Like the, the path for this basically. So we have like, pages and those are just markdown files in some order some structure yeah and that's basically it and as i said i i i include uh, i created also includes i think that was cool as well where do we have one here so let's say because this manifest comes with a lot of pages it, it comes very becomes very long right so what i what my my intention was to for instance, if I if I want to create a new version of this, I could just say like, and, and that's of course like someone like include, and then you do this, and then you can kick out everything except the one that you want to change. Right? So you potentially could just do this and this, and then your your manifest becomes very clean because you you only have this part where you where you do care about. I, this won't work because I I mistyped includes as the first one, but uh, yeah, I need to to fix it as well. But anyhow, that was the idea. Yeah. And and I, I have a little vision piece where I like what I what I didn't include yet, but I want to include or what I kicked out because it was ugly or whatever. That will that will come later in the in the presentation. Other questions? Okay. Okay. So. Yes. Um, you mentioned that this is something that uh, a solutions architect could really sort of benefit from because 
uh, it'll help with be being able to create packages for like for the purposes of developer experience. Is it correct? Or yeah, yeah. So the the, ex the example workshop I, I provided here or I show here mm -hmm. is like a GoLang workshop for um, tracing, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the first boilerplate is you create a little gin app, mm -hmm. it's a hello world one, and then you you can expect it has a Docker mm -hmm. compose file, a dev container, so mm -hmm. that you just uh, get going with with developing with with Zipkin or mm -hmm. with, with open tracing in this case, and yeah, and that's the idea, right? So and this is a workshop boilerplate or workshop uh, starting point or include that you can provide to your mm -hmm. developers, and mm -hmm. they don't care like they need don't need to care about the intro and mm -hmm. setup and all this yeah. like boilerplate. They just care about this one piece. Okay, I want to do this. And the idea is that you can have like a repository for your company and, and, and have different pieces and you can rearrange them. The, I mean, the expansion of the idea would be to like, if you have a customer presentation with a workshop, you can just use this to say, okay, we have this workshop for you. Mm -hmm. We present it to you. And afterwards we, we give you the, the YAML file, like we give you the manifest and the pages, and then you can start tinkering with it yourself mm -hmm. and adjust it to your own liking. And when we come back next time, we, we have like a customized version of the workshop by the customer itself. Mm -hmm. So like that would be great because then you don't come with your workshop, but you you have better insights of what the customer actually wants to do. That makes sense. Cool. Question? Yes. Uh, so, so far you showed uh, markdown files, but is there also some uh, like actual implementation like for the workshop, like some some boilerplate code, for example, or um, is, is that something that was included in that, or is it just for rendering the, the website? No, it's it's like the 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 tool will create an mkdocs file uh, folder, right, with an mkdocs yaml file and and the, the correct structure. Right. And yeah, the the QShop project is on Git on GitLab, so I mean I could go through the code as well, but I think it's, okay, yeah. no, I think that's not what we want to do, right? So. Yeah. So um, I, I and I just added this like uh, when I, when I went here like I had a long train ride so I to to spin a little bit my my head. Anyways, so why do you use GoLang? Of course, first I, I like GoLang. I'm a uh, I work for Docker. I, I'm a first time like I, I got introduced to Docker like a long time ago, and since everything is written in Go, it was like a natural cause to use GoLang. Anyways, but um, Working with GoLang, working with YAML, working with JSON and structs, that's very easy in, in GoLang anyways, as most of you know, I think. So that's why I, I GoLang was my first choice anyways. Um, and there's a lot of standard libraries that help. Like I, when I first started this, I created channels and Go routines to paralyze the copy and, and, and parsing of files, which was like super over-engineered because it made more problems than it solved. Um, but I think when I first started this, it was kind of like slow. <laughs> I said, I need to change this. Uh, when I went back to it like a year ago, so um, I kicked out all the goal routines and channels and it like, it, it finishes as you saw, like it finished in, in like a second or so. And I was like, okay, what, what are you doing back then? Anyhow, so I kicked out channels and goal routines, but I think that's a good use case for this, even though it wouldn't help performance, but it's just like to tinker around with Golang, that's kind of a cool uh, project anyways. And that's that another intrinsic uh, motivation to do this uh, is just to tinker around with Golang, right? So when I get back to this project every other, you know, like like this time, maybe in a year from now, I'm working harder on this as well. And then I will have learned a lot of Golang will have evolved and I can just include this uh, newly learned stuff and go uh, in, my, in my project anyways as well. Uh, another thing is cause, of course, static binaries for this is super helpful, right? You don't be preaching to the choir here. So, uh, can, can get over this. And I'm, as I said, I'm a container guy. And I, I think I forget a lot of stuff as well. But maybe uh, more important or more interesting, like what external libs I think I, I would highlight here. Uh, the, the, what I need for this, or I think I need for this, is uh, a DAP, right? So you, you create this, this um, or you, you pass a manifest and you want to create a, a graph, basically, from like the, the workshop, right? Because as I said, with inclusions and maybe overwriting, augmenting uh, different different parts of the workshop, I need some structure that I'm I'm able to manipulate in a very easy way and have, still have a consistent workshop that I can like push out. So, Heimdall R Duck uh, is a good project for this. 
Uh, yeah, of course, Cobra to create a command line interface. Okay, that's boring. Uh, and YAML also, of course, because I need to pass YAML and then create YAML. I think that's, that's of course, the ones. I think I missed maybe one or two as well. Anyhow. Um, what I, like the, the, the pipe dream is, and then of course our code, se code sections within the workshop. And what I would really like to do is to just have those code sections and then automatically execute them and create and capture the output and put the output next to the code so that you don't need to copy and paste it. And if you have new versions of software, you always need to go through the workshop and like copy and paste the output again. And I, I would like to automate this so that you can basically uh, run the workshop in the sequence that the, the doc provides you in the sequence and just take the output or take the code, execute it in the appropriate place. So let's say the setup is, is, is done in a virtual machine. It creates like maybe five containers. And then the, the code section has some, uh, some, 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 some snippets that tell you where to execute those codes. And then you, you can just run the code like a Python notebook and then or run, run the workshop as a Python notebook. And verify that it's it's working. I mean, that's also, of course, always a problem if like people create workshops, myself included. Then you figure out, okay, there's a problem because it doesn't work because something breaks. So with this verify code sections uh, feature, uh, it will be possible to just run the code with new versions and figure out if it still works. So that would be great. And you can also use it kind of also to maybe create an environment for a workshop, you 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 start uh, the setup section, like the setup chapter of the workshop, it will just create the setup and then people can just tinker, tinker around with it, but that would be great. Um, the flexible page source, why don't I have like, okay, of course I copied, but didn't copy it up. Flexible page, okay, that's so now I have just one line, it's case source and then a, a local path on the file system, right? What would be more like attractive and would be great is to have like different types of sources. So I can point to a repository, maybe a repository for a certain community or a repository for a company and say like, okay, this is our intro section. It has a branch, it has a tag, it has a path, whatever. Like it would be great to, to have this so that you don't need everything to be in a mono repo. And I implemented this in a prior version and I kicked it out as well, but I want to re-implement it is to, to have like flavors so that you, you have a, I, I misused the language picker basically at the beginning so that you had like a beginner, um, intermediate or expert workshop. And you can flip through those different kinds of workshops just by selecting a different language. So if you, if you use the uh, beginner one, then you would just have a very small workshop with very like minimal or basic stuff. And if you would, uh, have the expert flavor of the workshop. You you would like have all the more details and deep dives and so on. So that every in a workshop setting, like if you are on reinvent and you have 200 people, there are different kinds of persons, right? So you want to have different workshops for them so that they don't go very deep in a red hole that they don't understand. But experts can just flip the switch and say, okay, I have time. Go ahead. So that that would be great as well. Uh, yeah. Um, use preterm. I mean, you you saw this ugly output. And of course I want like, this was the, the, the parallel one, which was, was nice, but it was like slow. Um, and it will be cool to, to use P term because it, yeah. I have a question to, to, uh, regarding the, um, the multiple levels on the flavors. flavors. Um, I don't know if it's the only use case to have different levels of, um, yeah knowledge um does it really make sense to mix it up into one workshop it of course depends on on how it's how it's presented right if it's a website you could just have a landing page that says okay here is the landing page for this you could do this as well but i the idea was as i said if you have like a workshop that you present to like 100 people and you know that there are different personas you could they could just say at the beginning if you feel bored then just go one step from beginning to intermediate, and then you have more options to choose from, maybe longer sections of, of uh, workshop, like yeah. of, of uh, yeah. examples you need to do to go through. So that was the idea. And the and the language um, like selector was was, uh, was, a, was a cool choice, I think, for this, because I mean, 
it was in English anyways. I mean, we didn't create workshops for like Cantonese and like German and and uh, in English it was and most of them were in English. Well, all of them were in English, I think. Just a very very basic one for different countries, but mostly it's English. So I just missed you some English speakers. I think it was good. Yeah. So use P term, and I think that's that's it. What is P term? Yeah, Peterm is just um, a library that that create like helps you create nice uh, command line interface output. So you have like logging, and you can have like progress bars. I mean, you saw this progress bar here. It's just like a bunch of warnings with logros. <laughs> so having this in like in a nice progress bar, uh, but I guess that's fine. And I mean, what what I do here is like I said, I, I, I copy. The, the images, for instance, to the right place. What I in the, the past also did, but also kicked out because I wanted to reduce complexity, is like to uh, resize the image, like maybe crop the image. Like there are a lot of cool things that you can do if you if you touch the file anyway. So parsing what I what I already do is like parsing all the markdown. If I find there's an image, then I can like of course rearrange the parse so that it fits the target parse. Oh, what I forgot. Um, another feature is, I forgot this. Um, anyone knows Marp by any chance? It's a it's a cool Markdown tool that that failed. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I could. So Marp is is just. Um, it's a Markdown uh, tool that that or a tool that creates slides from Markdown, like super simple, right? So you you um, show an example. Here we go. So you you have this Markdown structure, and like each selector or, or separator is just to create a new slide, and you can have like usual Markdown stuff here. So you can include code and so on. What I what I'm looking for if I'm doing this M minus S mark, I'm looking for not for only for index MD pages in the different page directories. Where's my, sorry, here. Yeah. But I also look for, I also look for slides.md. And let me see if I can find one here. Here maybe, yeah. And and then when the manifest is 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 going to when the, the tool is going to the manifest, it picks up the slides and it creates one target slice, right? So it creates a slide MD file that includes all the um, slides that it it encountered during the parsing of all the files. So you can create you can create mark. You can create uh, this like a, a slideshow for the actual workshop, depending on what pages you included, which I think is also a nice, nice feature. So, so that's the slides.md from the landing page. And then there is a slide from the setup and a slide from the, so on. So you can just drop in next to the actual uh, working uh, workshop page, you can drop in other uh, like a slide MD file that creates like in the end a workshop um, slide deck for the actual workshop. Also, depending on and then people can update the setup part and the uh, the intro part and then this will like update the slide deck. I think that's also good. Didn't use it, but I, I'm convinced it's a good idea. Okay, but now I'm I'm finished. Other questions? And I think what I'm doing on time. I think I'm pretty good. So a kind of a suggestion uh, as well as a question, but it's a question that I ask everyone who I see using loads of YAML and Go together. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of QLang? QLang? C-U-E. No. So it's a kind of, it's a very interesting project. It takes a little while to get your head around. Um, but if you are using- Oh yeah, Q. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I tried it, but I think, uh, okay. yeah. But, I'm, I'm on your side, but I'm, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, QLang, maybe, do you mind to maybe refresh everyone? QLang, I think I- QLang is the second link down. Here you go. There. Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of difficult because it uses uh, essentially what's progressive typing. 
So you make progressive constraints on some kind of markup, can be YAML, it can be JSON or whatever. Um, and by doing that, you get this kind of uh, tested environment where you can template your YAML, let's say, for example, down to very, very simple definitions of what the variance is between different projects, which is kind of where you are there. But yeah. where your manifests, they could be more yeah. precise that way. Yeah, and I, I, I did do that at some point, but yeah, I think I, yeah, of course. I mean, that would be cool, right? So that you say, like, you can verify that this YAML is a is a is a valid YAML for this uh, project. So that... But you can also generate uh, Go code from it. You can do all sorts of things. It's, it's very uh, very powerful. It's a Go project itself. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I know one of the founders of a project used to work with him. So yeah, uh, well, then it's just take a bit of getting your head. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I broke my brain like a couple of times when I. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Other questions? So I, that's the UL GitLab QNIT minus Golang Q sharp. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit messy if you look at it, but I think it's, it works <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Cool, thanks. Oh. Yeah, I'm uh, just wondering, uh, why is the project called the QNIP Shuffle? Yeah, I'm, my, my, my nickname is like, or my, was the name of my bachelor report was Qualified Networking with InfiniBand because my, and my last name is Kniep, like K-N-I-E-B was, was already, like the domain was already um, used, so I needed to take something else. And Kniep, like, QNIP, KNIP, it's like the same pronunciation in German somehow. So yeah, <laughs> no reason. <either. laughs> and I, I, for my little tools, I always use the Q as a first letter to make it a signature Golang project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't know if it's the goal. That's, that's good. Yeah. And shuffle, like, because I shuffle documentation. Yeah. Cool. Thanks.